we should start. How it works is the more questions you have, the longer the meeting will go. We have some hard line, but usually open end. And I will ask to deliver this topic. Uh, this is JS stands for JavaScript. Who actually likes JavaScript? It's unusual. Uh, all Java Java developers hate JavaScript. And um, um, HTML5 a bit CSS and Java backend, and um, hence there is a little bit of microservices. I can show you what usually microservices are, and what we do in projects with them. If you have questions, you should interrupt me, and uh, we have discussion. This is the whole point, because otherwise, I mean, just presentation is a little bit boring for you, for me, not that boring because I have to talk and a little bit more excited. So um, about me. So I uh, said I prepared one slide. This is not entirely true. I have four slides. So, um, so this is like I started with Java in 1995, and uh, since 1997 I'm a freelancer. So I never work for for a company like how it's called em 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 employer and employee. Um, I always was a freelancer, and always had fun, and uh, and worked for larger companies. And the larger the company, the more fun it was because of politics and nice things, uh, right? So. Um, New one week old, there is a podcast because many things cannot be explained and many of you can ask, you know, why I'm doing all the stuff and it just evolved. For instance, my blog, I, I, I tend to forget things, so it's okay, solve things which are short to explain, I just write short blog posts and um, there is the uh, Airhex TV, what it is, uh, could be interesting to you, is the first Monday of the month I'm answering questions and the deal is I will never ever answer an email. So what I'm doing, I'm gathering all the questions, and one hour a month I'm answering all technical questions when it's possible. And the cool story is there are many, how it's called, attendees already, and they answering themselves. So I'm just watching and, and something is going on. So this is uh, my collateral damage. This is a web standards online workshop. This is the AHX TV workshops in Munich. Does not apply to you. And this was the last slide. So thank you means the session is over. Um, so. Um, I, I tend to show you a little bit Java E. Um, which application server are you using? Using an application server, Wi-Fi, Payara, Tommy. So Wi-Fi, JBoss, JBoss, WebSphere. Very good. So I have WebSphere installed, uh, WebSphere Liberty profile, but not the full WebSphere. The full WebSphere, it is the uh, the meeting is too short to boot the whole WebSphere. You know. So uh, I mean, uh, then we should schedule something else. But uh, the Liberty Profile is just perfect. I don't know whether you know uh, Liberty Profiles. I can show you how it looks like. So this is perfect, but the old one, full-blown WebSphere, does not work in my projects well. Okay, WebSphere, Java E, on a little bit front end, right? So, but let's start with the IDEs. So I'm using either NetBeans or IntelliJ. I have license for IntelliJ, and usually I use uh, NetBeans. Why? Because NetBeans is uh, free and um, in Germany. So I'm from Germany, forgot to mention that. And in Germany, until something you know is ordered, the project is over. So if I come by IntelliJ, it could take you no know, 12, uh, 12 weeks for 40 euros. So it, uh, if I show this, this, this might survive. I try to avoid Eclipse. And the only reason is uh, it's too much uh, plugins to install. So it's like it is just boring. And, and the problem is I'm consulting, consultant. So I'm working in parallel to for many companies. And uh, back then it was like every company had a different set of plugins. So I end, I think the last project I did was like 2006 with Eclipse. And I had about 30 workspaces. So different workspaces with different set of plugins. And since then it's like never ever Eclipse again. And I never regret that. Okay, you are probably using IntelliJ, right? Yeah, this is a perfect choice. If you start with Java, it might not be um, that obvious what happens because of the strange, of the strange key bindings. You know why the key, key bindings in IntelliJ are that strange? I asked the guys, they are Russian. So uh, 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 control and Y is like delete line, and this Y is U, U in Russian, and this means like delete something, or, or and and this was because the IntelliJ started as a file browser, and uh, and yeah, if you know it's Russian, then it is logical for me. It was never logical why control Y is delete thing. Okay, now I'm using uh, I'm using uh, Maven for all my projects, and I show you why. So let's start with uh, kind of microservice. So I'd, I would like to, to use this one. 
and just go to junk. Junk is all my speeches going there. And um, I was in Cluj a few times and Bucharest one time. And in Cluj I started, I had a chat before with Dracula and I was really proud of that and everyone hated the Dracula. I said, stop with Dracula, we don't like him. And I said, okay, what I should do? And someone said, okay, you can go with Horinka, Su Suika, Palinka, and, and the third, fourth one was the, uh, the heaviest one. So what he built distillery with microservices, a crowd to explain the things. Do you have something else? I mean, which is interesting here in Bucharest, or Dracula is a no-go, this Horinka, hmm? beer. So, uh, beers. <laughs> and uh, it doesn't matter. What I would like to do is just, you know, uh, uh, I mean, focus is not on Java E rather than a web, right? This time. So if you, if we, you can also shift the focus, but. So uh, what, what we have is we have a beers, a microservice, and this is how it looks like, and I would like to use today Java E7. And that's all. I get a question, you know, why I'm not using uh, Gradle? And the answer is because my Maven looks like this. And uh, I actually, tomorrow morning, I have a meeting in, in Munich, and they try to build a microservice, and they have about 30 dependencies here, and I'm going to delete everything because uh, nothing is needed, like they used Jakarta Commons uh, validator instead of bin validation. Or they use a lot of stuff without knowing why. So, and we are going to delete that. And um, by the way, um, uh, you are a bank, or I, I hope uh, if you are building something, you are building to last for uh, the next few few months at least. And um, what I don't get is the whole dependency management of serious projects. In my eyes, we have two modes of survival, right? So the one mode is don't use dependencies at all. So uh, and then you are only depending on your web sphere or my Whitefly or Payara. And the second mode is if you are using a dependency. You will have to check it out and make it buildable in-house. Why? This is how it's called hit by bus factor. So what it means is if uh, I, I, and, and on GitHub someone dies, right? So you can still go with your project. And um, there are many critical projects I reviewed that were depending on exactly one GitHub project which was maintained by one guy. And I don't know whether you know GitHub, it is very easy to click the delete, delete button and then everything is gone. It's not like uh, then, then you have your, your, your copy if you're lucky. So this is why I mean it really seriously, no dependencies. So this is the first in backend, no dependencies. And the next thing is no dependencies in the front end. Um, it's the same, this is, this is the second part of my, of my presentation, which I try to show you what I mean by that. It's a little bit early, but it works better and better. Any questions about that? Yeah. About dependencies. Huh? Dependencies. What dependencies? Yeah, uh, Spring is in my, uh, if I have application server, Spring forbidden. So either application server or Spring. So if you have WebSphere or Java 7 and Spring, is like you have everything doubled. So you have a double dependency injection, double wiring and everything, and no one knows what is actually used. So Spring in my project is forbidden unless you only have Spring. So just Spring Boot is okay, but not mixing Spring with application servers. Absolutely crazy. So it's like drinking Korinka and Sutka at the same time, right? <laughs> it's mine, it doesn't make any sense. Okay, so uh, any other questions? Okay, cool. Then what happens now? We have here JAXRS. So this is now the uh, JAXRS endpoint is configured. Nothing else to sell, to tell and sell. So um, in project what I see WebXML with configuration. I don't even know why it happens. It's not necessary. WebXML is completely optional because we have microservices here. So um, the question is, what is a microservice first? And what, uh, what I try to do or to explain is a small team, this is a one pizza team, it means two developers who can survive with one pizza, I would say, uh, create something which is meaningful to the business, like you know, beers and the other would be orders and the other would be delivery. This is a microservice. And what I see, at least, I, I was never in Romania a project, in German project, it's like the microservices sometimes they are created artificially and they have technical names, which is a really bad. Um, but it's really hard to maintain. So I think to create a great microservice, you need someone with really good domain knowledge to have the idea these two things are separate and they communicate with each other, so this will work. Which will never work, you know, that you hire a consultant and say, oh, you will hire me and say, create, break up the monolith. I could never create a nice microservice architecture because I don't know your business. So from technical point of view, I could do this, but it is no added value, okay? 
So in my eyes, is a simple monolith way better than you know crappy microservices. And uh, in, uh, the, the best practice is microlith. It means something manageable, small, and only one piece. So um, I was in a bank. Uh, it was not in Romania and also not in Germany. But the funny story was they have one year, two gigabyte, gig, no, not megabyte, gigabyte. And, but there was the whole bank. So they were able to deploy everything at once. So if you think about this, this is actually great. If they would manage to deploy the two gig in one second, it would be the best project ever. The problem was it took one hour. This was the problem. But if you were able to deploy the whole bank in one deployable, this is the best thing ever. Is it is deployed or not? You could each second deploy something new, right? But because it's not possible, we need microservices. So this is the first thing. So microservices is not, not something great. Rather than this is a workaround. This is my point of view. And um, what I can tell you, because it's also my blog, Commerzbank hired me three years ago, I think. And they asked me um, to help them. And they, they, they had the, 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 the full-blown web sphere. So OK, probably we could. Can we skip that and use something else? So what we did, we had Java 8 and Whitefly in officially and Docker. And now they're happy about the choice. But this was like very small team created six microservices. Each microservice uh, was very thin wall, was like about one Mac, and they communicated with each other. OK? So this worked. But uh, there was never my idea. I had no idea why they had six. I just said, OK, this is, you know what they are doing. And they, they, they created their own names and uh, their own the domain. And they knew from the beginning, because they say, no, this is different departments, and they are deployed at different times. So that there's some, some reasonable explanation. OK, so we have here the JAXA as REST. Then we have a, an, uh, an one class which exposed something to the, to the outside world. And what we will need is something like um, JSON. And this is not new. This is uh, Java 7. JSON. In J Java 8, we get JSON binding, so something um, which is more automatic, so JSON property with annotations. And um, what we can do, JSON create array builder, just to see what it works. Give me a beer, Romanian. What? No? Uh, wait a second, this is, this is uh, wrong here. Add Ursus. And then something else? You have only one, then Silva. how it's called? Silva. Silva. <laughs> like this? As you can see, now I'm expert. So no more Horinka rather than Ursus and Silva. I saw this Ursus at the airport. Not the Silva is new. So so we have this and this should be beers. And this should be also beers, and I will call that uh, beers resource. Now I could try. I don't have installed the app, the Web Sphere Liberty profile on my disk, but it's not in, in, uh, included here. The closest is Apache Tomi, but I would like to use, for instance, Wi-Fi 10.1 because I have no project with Wi-Fi right now that should be empty. So properties. So I will just choose the server, and uh, I would like to use the Wi-Fi 10.1, and say OK. And if everything works, this is not always the case because I'm in wireless land, sometimes problem with IP address, but um, with a little bit of luck, it might work. So now it should start. Takes too long, you sort to see. And if it doesn't, we can start Docker. So some I can show you something and go. So beers are forbidden, which is very true. Resources, beers, and this is also true. So why it happens? Because the browser re requests text HTML, and what I need is a header, and I have to say I need a header application slash JSON, and then I get Ursus and Silva. So uh, this was the uh, simplest possible microservice from scratch. And the simple is very important to me because I get more and more requests from startups. And I will show them, you know, we need half a day to install the application server, another day to set up the environment, and they will just walk away. So I, then we need Node.js. And I think with Java E, we're in the unique situation that we can set up a project in minutes. And this is what I did. I use a Maven archetype. I, uh, it is in, um, in, in Sonar Type Central. So I push it to the central. While created, I have my own archetype because it was the simplest possible. 
All other archetypes were a little bit crazier. They had a war plugin and all other plugins. I never knew why they have all the things. So I delete all the plugins and it still works. Questions? So if you go back tomorrow, look at your Maven POM. You have Maven or Gradle? Maven. So and delete everything until something like this remains. So the first question is whether I'm using you know, uh, super POMs. The answer is why you have no dependencies. If there is no dependencies, um, inheritance doesn't make any sense. OK? Right now, I have to deploy an OpenShift as a cloud-like environment. So the setting is a little bit more tricky, but still POM XML is still simple. Any questions? No questions. So no questions? You are very quiet. So your colleagues in Cluj were more excited. I think it has something to do probably because we are working with beer here and the others were with Horinka. So um, what's more important is the system test. So, and then I will skip that. So the system test, what it is, it is always for forgotten in the world of microservices. And this is even the new client. So what I did is just a template. And what I need is, this is the Jersey client, which is the reference implementation for, uh, for uh, the JaxRS client. Media JSON processing is the mapping between JaxRS and JSON. And this is the JSONP, the old spec. JSONP is the JSON object what I used. And in my eyes, for each microservice, we need a system test, which is completely separate. Uh, usually, I get question here, not from the audience rather than the projects, why I'm creating two projects and not one. And my answer is because only this is realistic. So we have two projects which are completely independent from each other as in the real world. So if you have two microservices, it's not like the first, this microservice has any dependence on the first one. There are no shared libraries. Otherwise, there's not a microservice. So what it means, microservices, everything, there is no reuse, no shared libraries, it, but code duplication is absolutely OK. So in microservices, you have to, code duplication is a best practice. So it is like it is. What it means by that is, if you have a customer which is transferred over the network, you will probably have in two microservices, two customers, two classes, customers, and not a shared jar customer. Why not? Because if we change the shared customer jar, everyone is affected. You got that? Just the unfortunate you know, consequence of having uh, microservices. OK, so now I would like to aut automate everything. So let's go here and say I would like to have a JUnit test. No. Something like this, and then beers resource IT. Just go with that. And um, just go with init. New client, I wanted to say. So, and the, um, this is the URI. And what I get is the target on the te under test, which is funny in German. Tut is, did something. So it did or did not. Beers. And then, and then, I would say this target other test dot uh, request media type is media type is application JSON and then I just do it a little bit shorter then I say get JSON array dot class and then just import that and yeah beers are certain of null, which is crappy, but good enough. Beers, and then, of course, something like this. So let's start this and see whether it works. So for unknown reasons, this is always lacking. And um, so it was green, but there should be some output. So where is it? Open and where is my output?
It just ignores my output. But believe me, if this green, so it should work. So you should see in here somewhere. Oh, wait a second. I don't like that. Um, so BSST from in Jenkins, you would do something like Maven fail safe integration test. And then we'll fire up the test. And you see beers, Ursus, and Silva. So we got we got that. Okay. By the way, this is Maven 3.5. It's nicer because of the color coded feature. So this is the one of the big deals of Maven 3.5. So um, this is unusual. What I'll show you um, in Germany, everyone is obsessed about statistics. So code coverage are extremely important. So what happens then? Everyone is forced to write JUnit tests. So last meeting last week, they were forced to have 70% of unit tests coverage. And what they did is, you won't believe that, they wrote tests for even this was tested. So I, so I mean, this is absolutely impossible to test. So at least it was instantiated you know, to keep the coverage high. And of course, if you have 70% code coverage, and you test stupid stuff, you can live off the hard stuff. So the, the last 30%, which make the difference, there is no time for test that. So I convinced the management that there's a lot of strange you know, practices. And what was lacking completely was the system test here, the BST. Why? Because there is, there were, there's no code coverage for that. No one cared about the system test. So in microservices, the system test is the mo most important test ever. Why? Because uh, first, you are forced to test something from the outside. And second, what we build is a microservice client. So we could create another microservice which talks to the first one just by copying and pasting the code here. Everyone agreed? Strange. Really? Yes? No? Almost. OK. So um, Docker. So what it could do? My new archetype creates a Docker file and just go with Whitefly as well. So I will just create here Whitefly. And um, I get always the question, oh, why are you using um, microservices for, are you using Docker? Not yet. OK, then tomorrow. Um, so um, why I'm using Java E application servers with Docker or clouds is just crazy. Why not using something like Drop Wizard or uh, other wizards or uh, uh, witches or whatever? So the, the answer is, I just show them the following. So what you can do now, I go to command line. Ah, it was too many dots. So I can build the whole project with uh, Maven clean, uh, just Maven package is enough. And then I can say, okay, docker build minus T and ing beers. So now it's documented dot, this was your idea. So, and what should happen now is, um, so everything was built. So now I think it took about three seconds. And what happened is it built the war first and then executable image. And by the way, it's the largest possible image based on OpenJDK 1.8 full, CentOS full, Whitefly full, not a web profile, not Swarm, the biggest possible Whitefly. And this takes, I don't know, one second. So Docker images, this is important to look at. The Docker images here. I have some images. So 20 sec 26 seconds ago, as you can see, my image are 560 megs. You can say how you can call it micro. And 560 megabytes for Hello World beer is a little bit too much, right? But the cool story is, if I go here and say Docker history, I think, yeah. What you see here, this is actually the true. While Java E is so, is, is so interesting for microservices, you see that what we did, we created a four kilobyte microservice 52 seconds ago. And everything else is five months old. So because of Docker and clouds, only what changes gets deployed. Everything remains the same. This is why I'm for the zero dependencies wars, because then my war is four kilobyte, or at most, I mean, if you are reasonable, try to write one megabyte business logic code. It's crazy big. So um, in, uh, in one, uh, I think, in one startup, they're building the app for two years 
without external dependencies is like around one meg. It's really a huge amount of bytecode. The wars are only so big because they are including, you know, crazy amount of dependencies. This is the problem. But without dependencies, Java is very lean. Just why I'm so for it? The smaller the war, the faster the deployment. That's all. So I'm only interested in speed. So whether you would include dependencies, I actually don't care that much. What, what really interests me is the speed. So that all the attempts, which I never, get, never got actually, is the, the uh, fed jar, uber jar, or fed wars, where you are building the application server with the war. I don't even get it. If you think about this, is nothing changes here. And I, I, I will have to build the whole infrastructure over and over again. Also, there's no change. OK? So you saw this live. So what I did, I used stock maiden from scratch. The only thing what I didn't did, I didn't build uh, the, uh, the white flag from scratch, but I built it five months ago. And this is in my public Docker repository, so I don't have to rebuild it over and over again. And what I lose with this approach are 560 megs of disk space per machine, not per service. If I would create now five services, there would be the same image with this hash from Whitefly and this top image layer, it's, it's, called, it's not called image rather than layer, will change. Questions? Very good. How big would the image be if you use Spring Boot, for example? With Spring Boot, yeah. it will be different. In Spring Boot, there will be no layers here. And the last layer would be around, so um, I was told, um, I, I d never did a Spring Boot project, so I'm, but uh, attendees told me around 20 max. So if you're using JAXORES and everything included, so the war with everything is 20 max. But since I will have to build 20 max over and over again, and I'm building three kilobyte. And what it makes the difference is if you have clouds. So I... Um, I don't uh, manage to do this right now because I need the credentials from Amazon. But what I did once on stage, I pushed to ECS and to pushing, you know, three kilobytes or 20 megs is a huge difference. So, and, and yeah? Yeah. And that way, we can provide only a small jar only with our business, and the uh, spring dependencies will be in the class part of, uh, of the JD, uh, JDK. But this is no more Spring Boot because the whole idea of Spring Boot is that you are you you are declaring the dependencies in the in in then creating an executable something, right? So this would be not Spring Boot, something else, right? No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, technically, it's possible no, because because the uh, the container is in the embedded one. Yeah. And we have it in the in the class path mm -hmm. in the JDK mm -hmm. or JJRS, and uh, we can uh, refer it. Yeah, but this will be no more fetch jar. This is a similar approach to what I'm doing here. Yes, yes, it's a yeah. similar approach. But you we we deployed only uh, a small uh, a jar with only the business. Yeah, this is very good. I mean, this is the same. If it's, it's doable in the spring as well. Yeah, this but this is not what they're propagating. So what I uh, hear uh, over and over again is Uber jar or Fed jar. This is actually the best practice. Not only Spring, but all the others. I mean, this is Dope Wizard. Everyone is for Fed. And I had a conversation on a conference. Why is it best practice? And the answer was they started before Docker. And then if you have a bare metal machine, then I see the, the, you know, the advantage. Because then you can just uh, just start Java managed jar, and the only thing we should have care about are the ports. But since Docker and clouds, it doesn't matter. So you build something like deployment in application servers. But I have it for 20 years already. So what what I'm what I like here is what what I told you. I'm consultant since 1997, and this what I show you right now is an old technology. So what it means, if you are in a larger company, you go to Stack Overflow and you, f you find all the answers to stock Whitefly, to stock WebSphere, WebSphere is a little bit strange, but Payara and all the others. And um, if you create something unique, let's say your own server with your own class path, this is your unique snowflake. Only you build this and you are able to understand what happens behind the scenes, you know. This is actually why I have so many Java E projects or microservice projects, because the I go to the client or the customers see there's no difference to your infrastructure. The only difference is we use Docker, 
which is a part of OpenShift Kubernetes anyway. So this is the future. So just go for it. And if I show them, perfect. But if I come in and say, you know, we have to change everything. We need another framework, and we have to build our own second Y. It's different. But I, you can do it. Of, of course, you can do whatever you like. But at the end of the day, it is not going to be a fetch jar, an Uber jar. What you get is a thin war. And then my next question is, what you build is deployment with application server. What's the difference? The only difference will be you have a custom application server, and, and I use a stock application server. Agreed? So, very good. So, I'm a developer, so not a speaker. So I try to understand it also for my projects, because I have to, you know, convince developers as well, or management, or whoever. So, what's um, also interesting is this one, say, uh, okay, this is a PT. Because I switched to uh, JDK 1.8 for this, because they're a little bit too early. Um, let's see whether I was able to launch it. Why not? If not, it is, I actually just doing this because we had a conversation about application servers right now. Let's see, I think home, right? Uh, bin. Okay, so we have here the Whitefly, which started in uh, Hopefully not in Docker. This is my external Whitefly, right? No? Yes? And it already comes with stock settings, like 512 max and 128 ms. So, and I go to monitor here and perform GC. As you can see, now it takes 40 max of RAM. And uh, we could perform a load test, for instance. We could say, OK, but what's about the runtime overhead? Apache benchmark. Oh, this is inch. Uh, I need the URI. So let's say this AB, if you have a um, HTTP server Apache installed, you get the Apache benchmarks with, which is great for us short hacks or unit tests, and let's say, let's go with 1,000. And localhost does not work here. This sometimes happens, so I have to use the IP address. One, two, seven. So as you can see, this was slow. <laughs> no, around 3,000 transactions per second. And uh, what we can do is, this is always good, go to sample and CPU. So we, we are profiling Whitefly right now. And I do it over and over again. And what interests me is, what's the overhead of the EGB container, CDI container, and you won't find any. So the, uh, the, the HTTP is the biggest, has the biggest impact, because of course, it has to parse in all the headers, and lots happens, and reflection, and JAXRS. But the whole CDI and EGB stack is not existing here. So we measured several times, so if you, if you don't use the standard, the question is why? Is it yes, too big, too slow? There should be, should be a reason. And one reason could be because this is too boring, but uh, now I'm over it because at the beginning of my Java consultancy, I created five different servers over and over again, and one point of time, said, okay, crap, leave it, just focus on domain and forget about defensive stuff. And this is, I think, the, the most fun then I can sleep well because I go away. I'm not afraid that my client has no idea what Scala is or whatever any f fancy technology, you know. And 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 if I get if I get uh, uh, requests, they are more reasonable with added value. Okay. So this is just different. So we will have to argue what you will gain with an alternative. So this is this what what interests me. So if there is no alternatives, I go with stock application servers. It's the same with Java. It's so like, why I'm using Java on the server? It's like, why I should use Node.js? I mean, what's the difference? So what is the added value? So the, you know, the tooling is better, everything is better. So it, it should be something. Everyone agreed? Very good. Kotlin. Um, the Kotlin, the, the plus on Kotlin is at least 
that uh, it is uh, uh, well integrated with IntelliJ. So this is uh, the this is the, otherwise I will completely ignore it right now. As I would say, at least you know an, an IDE vendor is behind that, and of course Android. This is a big hit. This is the the IntelliJ and Android. So we can. But if there will be no Android, I will say ignore it. But with that, you can talk about that. So if you do a lot of Android work, go with Kotlin. On my app, I have to say the question is: If I go my way with stock Java 8, I, I'm going to be really faster with my development, or is going to be easier to understand or whatever to an average programmer? This is the question. And if you go to the market, at least in Germany, no Java is number one, then JavaScript, and Kotlin, I don't know, somewhere. Okay. And um, the problem I have is we had a chat before the show here. My only problem is time. So uh, I think you, you have too little time. And uh, we, you have to focus on something. And I have to say, JavaScript, CSS, HTML5, and Java, and I'm learning the whole time, we have no time. So if you give me Kotlin, Scala, and Clojure, then I can you know, quit my jobs and just learn new languages the whole time. And what is the added value? This is like, imagine construction worker who builds houses. And he would like to try a drill every day, and a different drill, just for fun. So it is a little bit boring, you know, I would like to have a, a bigger drill because I, I used the drill for 20 years and it just works. But why not this reactive drill, you know, which uh, with, you know, a uh, uh, nuclear engine and, or, or batch or whatever. Only we developers are so crazy, so I have to say. So other, uh, all other, you know, they're just working and providing added value. And in one point of time, we say, you know, it works, but it's boring, so we do something else, reactive. So, so a, a, a developer wanted to have reactive programming. There was no reason, but he wanted, you know, to have uh, something reactive. So, okay, then create something. I have no idea where, but here's your corner, create reactive. The other guys wanted to cache. <laughs> Just caching, and it turned out that he had PhD in caching, so it's also interesting. So everything has to be cacheable, you know. But this is not like how it, real, how the how the world is outside. Okay. Other questions? Someone asked me. Modules, you say? Yeah. Mm -hmm. You only use what you need. Java EE, Java EE doesn't have that possibility, right? Yeah. I mean, you're using a full-fledged application server for a Hello World program. Yes. And microservices should be, from my understanding, really small. Yes. Mm. It's not defined that way, but okay, could be. And uh, I, that's what I don't understand. Yes. Why use 600 megabytes of storage for once. one? Yeah, the once, machine. Yeah, for one instance of a microservice. Right? Yeah. If I, uh, microservices, uh, can, you can spin up multiple uh, uh, containers, right? Yes. To scale. Yeah. So I'll keep using uh, a lot of storage? No. no. The cool story is, if I, this, is, this is the mis misunderstanding. So the 560 max is just like on my storage once, mm. and they won't grow. If I start 10, then what happened was the th three kilobytes are getting replicated, but not the storage. With, with plain Docker? Yeah. Okay. So if I started, so I started once. I, I didn't start this, actually. Docker run minus D minus P, 8282, 8080. Uh, name, ink one. And it was ink beer, I think, right? Beers or beer. You know it still? Oh, this is completely wrong. Uh, Something like, and uh, let's call it here, not ink, rather than beers. So now it started. Docker PS, now we have the microservice running on the port. But it's not like I have 560 megabytes more. This is exactly the same as it was before. Docker images. And uh, there's no difference, but because this is just installation once on my machine. No difference. But you, they should. You are right. So the question is, you know, what you will gain? We had experiments. Uh, five years ago, around five years ago, we have a client who didn't uh, use GSF. He said, we have Whitefly. Why we not remove the GSF runtime? So we could. You know how big it was? Around one meg. 
Then I look at, uh, for instance, the Glassfish or Payara. It's already fully modular. Actually, all application servers are modular. All application servers are microkernels based on OSGI. So you can remove whatever you like. So EGB container, they say we hate EGBs. Can we remove that? You know how big the EGB container on Payara was? 683 kilobytes. So the question is, why fiddling with that? You know, what I gain in project, if I remove everything, there is one, one, advantage, and I spoke with the team, would be security. You know, this is what you could argue. If you remove everything, there is secure than without, but it's not like if you are removing EGB, there is not like you get an, a pod less, or there's less communication channels, just internal library. But this would be one argument what I would understand. And for me, what is more important than micro-optimization is developer ergonomics. Download the server and implement the use case in the next five minutes. This is what really counts in my eyes, but this is, you know, discussion to be discussed. So this is, and I think Java 9 modules, I won't use the modules a lot in enterprise projects. Why? We have no problems with disk space, and why I should do this? I mean, you know, what could be interesting, like you could package Java with the application with JLink and provide an executable something, but yeah, but this is a very specific case. And the more you optimize, like uh, you said, application servers are not modular, they are very modular. For instance, uh, if you download Web Liberty Profile, it's just microkernel without anything. And then you can add JAXORES, Servlet, and you could do this. I asked myself, why I don't get everything? Actually, uh, as you're probably aware, this is EE4J. This is Eclipse uh, Enterprise for Java. So the whole Java EU was, was open sourced, and now it is moving to Eclipse. And there is a discussion, so I actually participate today also in the discussions of the E4J mailing list, and they are starting already with modularity. And, and what I will propose is, I just have to think how to frame it, is for me, what will be the best possible case for Java E, you get one single dependency with everything included, and then you can just focus on, on business. What I would like, what I wouldn't, what I personally would not accept in Java E is that the first day I have to know First, oh, I can show you something. Um, have to decide, should I use, you know, JAXORES, Servlet, JMS, and then assemble my own application server? The question is why? What I gain? And, and, and if there are just 10 megabytes, you know, less or, uh, uh, consumption, no one is interested in it. I'll show you an example. Whitefly Swarm. Just imagine you are a young developer, you are young, but even younger developer, right? And you look at this and it say first, uh, right, right size your services. You saw already, so what we can gain, it, it can be never less to 40, uh, than 40 max. Actually at Java 1, two weeks ago, I compared all these servers to Hello World Java and the difference was 35 megabytes of RAM. So I, I think even, even uh, Spring Boot or, or Drop Wizard cannot be less than Hello World Java. I mean, this is the absolute minimum. And if you look at this, they say, okay, create your own runtime and project setup. I mean, I have to use this, then this, and then they have, where is it? They have create a project, then I can uh, click on the project. And then they ask me, you know, what do you like to have? JAXORES, EGB, transaction, ribbon, hibernate search. And the question is, why I have to do this? Is imagine I create my runtime with JAXORES and EGB, but forgot transactions. So and then I'm implementing something and then it should create another server just you know to get, uh, I don't even get the concept, so here. And I had uh, actually the uh, conversation with the, with the guys behind that and they say, uh, actually, yeah, but you are right. It's like, what you will gain here? If I generate a project, there should be a difference. This, what I showed you with Whitefly is maximum. 560 is the maximum on 30 megabyte RAM. And um, what, I, what I have is this Whitefly swarm with everything and this is very similar to the Whitefly, you know? So if you create just a white flag swarm with JAXORES, I guess, you, 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 could, you could have a 50 megabyte uh, hard disk space, something like this. And uh, at startup time, you would, the RAM consumption would be the same. But I would argue there are no issues with hard disk space in projects. Agreed? So if you have reason, I'm all for it. If not, we will have to, di to, to discuss. But this is, I think, how it's called agile development, right? postpone all irrelevant decisions to later. And whether it you know, consumes 30 megs or 10 megs, I don't care though, later. And later is no time to discuss about the runtime. Agreed? So this is how it is, agile development. 
Um, I hope you agreed with me. And German and modules, I'm really, really a little bit afraid of this, I have to say. I already see German architects create everything highly modular and no one understands what's going on. And we had already the experience with OSGI. So five years ago, everything has to be modular in OSGI, and then there were specific experts who only they understood, you know, all the class path problems. And now if I ask at conferences, no one uses OSGI anymore. It's like, why? As of five years ago, it's fashionable. You spent, you know, many years of OSGI, and now it's gone. So you know what? And, and my monolithic Java e server still works great, and even better than before. OK? And we have to be careful what we are doing. If we start with modularization and playing with projects, the Node.js guy will come in and just kill us, or Python or whatever. They say, okay, we just focus from day one on use cases, and Java will go away. Not because it's wrong technology, it's just wrongly used. Cool? So, um, should I load balance for you, the microservices, with HR proxy, but this, it will just work? If you have time, remind me if you would like to see, do some load balancing. Okay? And now focus on the web a little bit. Or dependency injection, I can show you more stuff, but I showed it so many times. So would like to, who is for Java E right now a little bit? And who is a little bit for web? There's only one guy, and the other one should we stop and drink something? So um, then, what do you need cores? You know what cores is? I will do cores later. Do cores later, and uh, I will show you the, the error. Mm, beers UI. So this is a nice IDE called Microsoft Visual Studio Code and Microsoft changed completely in the last years. This is more like Sun before, I would say. Um, Sun Microsystems, yeah. And what I would like to do is to open the browser. This, so, and So there is a nice tool, it's called Browser Sync. On this Browser Sync tool, it is included in uh, Angular CLI and, and, and React, and this is the tool behind the scenes which synchronizes the browsers. And um, this is almost a standard, and this tool is fully optional, optional but, but really nice. What it does, it, it scans the source folder, watches for changes, and pushes proactively the changes to the browser. So whatever I do, it happens immediately in the browser, which is a nice experience. Uh, I wouldn't have the tool, I would have to click refresh over and over again. So this is the only optional tool I have. So now, what's the idea here? I'll show you my philosophy of the backend. <laughs> hmm? Yes, the NetBeans, the, there is a uh, NetBeans plugin for Chrome, and there's something similar. But if I would start with NetBeans, there are people in the room who hate NetBeans and say, okay, what's without NetBeans? And then they say, okay, this is neutral. This is the only reason why I use that. And um, why I show you this? Uh, what happened the last two years is um, Angular was very popular. This is like a uh, Google framework. But I like Angu Angular 1 a lot. And then this, the, they decided to create Angular 2. And it took uh, two years. And uh, I have clients which really used Angular 1 a lot, and they didn't manage to migrate to Angular 1.5, and they stuck with Angular 1.3, which means get game over. They cannot, they cannot upgrade anymore. And, um, and in one project, is like a portal with Angular 1.3, and the other project uses Angular 2, 3, 4, 5. I don't even know what the current version is. Uh, actually, the current version is no version anymore. They say there is no version, there's semantic versioning. And, um, and Evergreen Angular, and they, they were, were not, it was technically not possible to include a one widget from this Angular to the other Angular. So, okay, why I need for widget Angular? I mean, there should be an added value. This was similar discussion, yeah, I know, whatever. And, uh, and, and what we did at the end of the day, we just used web standards without any external technology, and it works perfectly and it's very simple. And this is what I would like to show you today a little bit in web. What happens if you fully rely on standards and, uh, and how, how, how far you can go. So this is, and, and, and what, what, what we do in project, we just do exactly this. So we fully rely on HTML5 and standards. And um, I don't know, who knows Swing, the old Java technology? Someone, Swing? Exactly. So actually in web, 
if you if you if you are using standards, you get exactly the same experience with Swing. It's very very similar to Swing development with plain JavaScript. So this is what you get for free, and this is what I would like to show you. If not, we we can go back to the server. Just stop me, and we go we do load balancing with microservices if you like. So it depends on you. But I thought this is more interesting. Okay, so then start with browser sync, and it just um, opens the browser, and you see it's a beautiful UI. First and second, two diffs, which are not very readable. But if I do this in uh, green, this is green. Uh, this is what Browser Sync did for me. It just synchronizes behind the scenes the browser. Questions so far? No questions. So what it is, it is an uh, HTML app. So this is like two diffs in a section. And uh, this app.js is loaded at the, at the end. And this basically is. So. Um, um, what I did with my script, I just created a skeleton, so minimal project, so I can go with that. Nothing happened. So this is the console log, and this should be visible in browser. Hello Web Standards is here. Okay. So now, you know ES6. Who knows already ES6, ECMAScript 6? Cool. I'm, I'm just um, thinking about, okay, let's do Java. Class, beer view. I just thought about what I should show you, whether to start with uh, ES6 classes or just plain, but go the, you are Java developer, so you will get it. So we can save time. I was told we have only five hours or something. So, <laughs> but, uh, so we have this, and the only difference to Java is the constructor here. Yeah. In Java, there is no constructors like this. There are small the name, but you can do this here. And let's kill, kill the first framework. It's called jQuery. The jQuery is a framework which uh, allows you to select DOM elements. It's actually no more needed because we have something better. Document query selector. And the query selector. And by the way, the editor I uh, use from uh, Visual Studio Code is the name is completely free. So, and this is based on Atom. And this is Atom with plugins. So it's like. Uh, that's comparable. Not Eclipse, rather than IntelliJ or WebStorm. And WebStorm, if you have IntelliJ, uh, take IntelliJ or WebStorm. WebStorm is even nicer. It's like full-blown IntelliJ without the Java part. So the wizards are nicer and, and so forth. Okay. Query selector. So I can select what? Let's see. Um, let's make it unique. So ID first. And uh, ID is ID is this first. And then I can say this is the first equals. So and now I declared a variable first in the class beer view, and I selected the first here. So I did a lots of a lots a little bit Java fix and lots of Swing uh, programming is not that different. So what we had before a model view controller, so we created the classes, and this is reminds me extremely to the old days. Where I'm going with that? What I'm using right now are just the browser APIs and DOM APIs, exactly what I did in the backend. In backend, I fully relied on Java and nothing else. So if you do it this way, you um, just my beautiful slides, where are they? Here, yeah. there will be no migrations. So the cool story is, what I'm showing you right now is not to start with a framework, rather than start with the standard, and then, if it's not enough, then add something else to it. And what I will show you at the end because there are some problems with that approach. You cannot fully implement everything from scratch. And the problems are, of course, always tables. This is always hard to implement, regardless of which, which frameworks. It's tables or grids, always a problem. OK, so we have that. And I would like to instantiate a class. Uh, this is view equals new beer view. And of course, I could just see here console.log. This first, and we see the first here, so if I you see this is selected, which is actually not what I would like to see. So instead of log, I can use dir. And with the dir, what I see here is the DOM node. And the cool story is, it's maybe not that apparent for Java developers, but the um, DOM node is very similar, or no, it's not very similar. It, um, you already use the org W3C document and element for XML parsing. This is the early days of Java if you parse some XML. What you already used was the DOM API bindings for Java. 
And this is the DOM API bindings for C and browser. So what it means if you manage to, to, to parse XML, you know already the API. And this API is standard. So what it means is I can on the fly manipulate the elements here. So what I could tell is I could go here and say this first inner text and inner text is standard API. So it will never disappear and call it Ursus. And this is also Ursus. So and for browser, if you go to the elements, there is no difference. It doesn't even know whether this came from the markup or dynamically. Th this is the deal. So the whole markup, this is for Java developers not apparent. The markup is not like mandatory. I could just deploy one liner to the browser and create everything dynamically. This is what Twitter did at the beginning, but it was too slow and they have a hybrid. Okay? So I get uh, off questions, what about server-side rendering in, in Java E, like MVC? I think it's valuable because you can pre-render stuff on the server and do only what's different on the client. Then you get the best performance. Questions? So what I like with this approach, because it's standardized, so I can go here, let's see. So there is DevDocs. This is a nice site, DevDocs.io. So I can search for uh, div, and you find HTML div element, and this HTML div element is exactly the hierarchy. Uh, we have here HTML div element, inherits from HTML element, element node, and event target, and this is by all browsers. By the way, this uh, DevDocs.io is a nice offline app. If you install this, it installs in browser, and you have the API the whole time. You don't, don't even need uh, internet collection. So if you're working a lot with web, DevDocs.io, uh, really nice. And you can search, yeah, this is, um, there was another tool, I forgot the name. You see DOM, DOM events or whatever I, I use, I, it is already installed in the browser. This is an offline app in, uh, uh, installed in Chrome. So what I like is, I like Java E, so I like also this. Why? I only have to learn the stuff once. I can you know, ignore all the frameworks. And if you think about this, Angular, Ember, everyone has to use this anyway. So if there's a problem, it is really uh, nice to know how the API actually works. And for me as consultants, invaluable. I learned Java, you know, I don't know, 10 years ago, and still valuable, and this is the same with that. What's also my observation is, Java developers really get that. So what I show you right now, it looks like Java class. The only difference is constructor, and I didn't have to declare in my fields, so I can explain this in five seconds. Okay, what's cool story is the true web hackers, web developers are really problems with that, so, but now it's a really programming. There was an internet, uh, uh, a question, you know, what I should l learn first, jQuery or JavaScript, now it's over. I mean, now you have to learn programming, which is uh, absolute good for us Java developers. Okay, questions about this? No questions? If you want to create really a responsive interface, mm -hmm. you know, with frameworks, it's much more easier no. to implement. No. No. Uh, remind me this. I will show you what I will do with respons responsive means that it adapts to the UI. This is what I mean. That if you have uh, on, on Apple Watch looks differently than on big screen, right? This is responsive. No. I would say it could be easier, but it is usually harder. But we, have, we will have to discuss this. What I would like to show you a little bit of standard CSS layout, and then we'll talk about this. Um, what I um, would like to do is to create a text box and a button, and to show how the eventing works, and, and data binding, and then we can go to responsive if you like, okay? If it's too trivial to you, just say, okay, stop with that, we are already, then we do something else. So, but this is uh, for Java developers, I find out it's not that trivial. And after presenting this, we killed many frameworks, which is al always good. So my idea is zero dependency on client, zero dependence on the server, everything is thin, and we move fast. This is the idea. So, uh, what we will, we'll need is, ah, by the way, a tool, a great tool, if you are kind of web developer, so what you could do is uh, div, let's say, with the content uh, 10 times, and it creates 10 divs for you. Or I could say something like, I would like to have nav, and below the nav, there is a um, a two times. So it is two a be below nav. Or 
I can say that uh, div and the class is what was first. So class first Hugo, and this is exactly what we had. So uh, this is called Emmet. E-M-M-E-T is absolute standard for NetBeans. There is a plugin. WebStorm is already included. And uh, there is a cheat sheet, which is great. Emmet cheat sheet. You have to th this is the next thing you have to do is the Emmet cheat sheet. And print it out and learn the cheat sheet. And you will be twice as fast if you like coding this way. So if you like frameworks, not always. I mean, then they will generate. Last week, a client wanted to see Angular 405. And I created from scratch. I, I would like, I don't like to do this right now because I need lots of internet and uh, slower. But if you like to uh, generate a new Angular app, 40,000 JavaScript files downloaded for Hello World. And no one complains. But I had already complained that the applications are too big, but there's nothing against Angular. OK? So if you are have to use Angular, I'm sorry. So, But uh, I don't know what you are doing. So uh, hopefully you are not offended by, by my <laughs> presentation here. So and of course, um, I uh, forgot to mention, Angular 1 uh, stopped, and Angular 2 or 4 and 5 are absolutely not compatible with Angular 1. There is, in theory, some migration, but I never see, saw it in action, because it looks completely different. So it might work, but it really looks, looks different. OK, so what I, so Emmet, done. So this is your homework. And then um, we have the div class, and let's say, ah, this is R2D2. This is, this is actually a cool one. Um, <laughs> so button. Uh, let's say he 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 uh, needs some <laughs> button, and let's call the button ID. Click. Click me. So how to register the button? So I go here. I can say okay. First, I, I will have to find the button. This button equals document dot query selector click and this was the ID click so we have the button and oh this always happens so and then what I did I, I created a method usually register listeners or init listeners this was my way in swing init listeners we do the same here a method init listeners and in this method this in it listeners. By the way, in JavaScript, you always have to write this. I do it anyway with my coding style, so it's no problem. But if you omit the this, it won't work. So in it listeners, and what I can do, I can say now this button on click, and I can pass a function. This is like swing or awt at action listener and a method. So now the function, I have to declare the function, but what JavaScript does, it supports more or less lambda functions. They look identical, this is my problem. But there's a fat arrow, and with Java we have thin arrow. So if you program at the same time both, you are in trouble. So um, it means we have the event, the button click event, and then I say, OK, pass the event to here. And now if I click the button, it should work. It doesn't. Click button in the listeners this console on click button button. It's a pity. No longer help by D first. Ah there. You see? The inner text of the first. Now it works beautifully. So the button is now intercepted. We get an error, and there, it, back in Java, just stopped, you know, processing. So we tried catch would work. There is a try and catch available. Looks identical to Java. Question so far? So we have button, and uh, another input type text. Uh, uh, input type text. Another input element is the, um, input, and the fallback is always text. So if you don't write anything, it's text. But there are nicer things than this, and um, so input, and. Uh, Always IDs. So IDs are great for programming, but are not that ba uh, good for styling. So they are forbidden for styling, good for programming and testing. And let's say uh, be uh, or name. So remember ID name. I always forget that. And what I can do here, I can send document query, query selector name. And this is usually I would do something like this. Input name, click button, have a na naming conventions, input name. OK. So now, what I can do here, I can say, OK, this input name. 
And now there are plenty of standardized event listeners on key down or key, key, key up on change, really depends, and this is standard. It means this is absolute standard. So if you have to create a component with React, Angular, Polymer, whatever, you will have to understand it anyway. It's not like it's a secret magic behind the scenes here. So um, input name, let's say on key down, and let's try this, e console log e. So you see here, key seems to work. Okay. Now, you can say, okay, but I would like to see the key, not this. So what I already know, I think it has to be e dot target dot value. And now we have the key. So there is an always oh, Angular show data binding, how easy it is. So let's see how it works without Angular. I will try to go here and say, okay, in this case, what I could do, I could say this first dot inner text. Hopefully it is there. And there is no, ah, this is a uh, first is not, uh, this is a class and I need ID. And now you, we have almost kind of data binding, right? So, and you can say, okay, but I would like to validate how to do this. We could say, okay, instead of key down on change, I think. And now it, it, if I leave, the, uh, the, the component, then it changes the state and then the event fires. So um, what I like, every th everything I show you right now is absolutely standardized. And what is the source, single source of truth? This is uh, uh, the specs and there's a nice, nice documentation in MDN, Mo Mozilla Developer Network is one of the best resources for something like this. And I look it up, what the cool story is, I've remembered this, I know it for all frameworks and you know, every two weeks we get another JavaScript framework, I would argue it's impossible to keep up with JavaScript frameworks. Questions about that? Questions? Yes, no? So, now about so, some, you know what destructuring is? Destructuring? Okay, somehow relevant because we get destructuring properly in Java 18.3 or later, so in Java. Um, they're, they're thinking about this in Java. Um, what I could do is, you could say, okay, this is not very nice with the, um, with that. I could try to do that and say, no, this won't work. That's, this is a bad idea. Show later with, uh, I plan to communicate with the server, that would be a better idea because this is just a path. Destructuring works better with objects, with JSON object. Okay, we have this, and now about, very brief, because I forget it, otherwise uh, the progressive stuff. Someone asked me, who was it? Progressive you, yeah. Uh, first, how to create progressive apps? And um, So first, my markup is really crappy. Why? What I did is what we did for years is I just use markup which is absolutely not semantic. And this is the huge difference between HTML4 and HTML5. The only difference is in HTML5 all the tags have semantic meaning and in HTML4 they have any meaning. For instance, the small tag in HTML4 means small font. In HTML5 it means irrelevant content. Something like copyright notice is not relevant for the content. So this is the big deal. So what it means is, what we have to do first is to establish a logical structure of the page. So we have to, to this is even fancy, fancy term is called information architecture. So, and what it basically means is, you say this is footer, content, nav. So let's do some information architecture and um, Let's change that, so how it would look like is like this. So I would say we have a main area and there's a main. So then I can say, okay, what we get is, let's say we get a header and the header is h2, welcome. Then we get some content and uh, with section uh, ursus, 
Ursus und Silva, right? Silva. And then we have Futa with small and by. And very important is Nav. Why is Nav important? Who knows that? Hmm? Yeah, why not UL on LI? Yeah, very good. Keyboard and screen readers, even more important. So all the screen accessibility. So if you are just inventing your own tags with diff, or uh, I saw designers proposing instead of using button diffs, it is like it does not work properly. So all power users, so you're already pretty skilled. So they, they rely on key bindings. And the, the best thing to do is to use native components and not build your own. So if there is an input text, use input text. And don't use something else. Everyone agreed? You have to. I mean, this is common sense. So uh, there is no, no reason to do something else. So but now we have that. OK, now what we could do, I could say here first, I could say nav. And what I learned is, this is actually cool. If I always use this light, looks better. So this is blue. We had the footer. Uh, header. This is light, golden, rody, yellow. This is the best color ever. So what we have an article, I think. Article. And the article is um, background. Um, light. Everything covered. Perfect. And now, what's new is, uh, by the way, what I show you right now is um, standard browser features. And there's important page, can I use? Dot com. Can I use? Can I use? Not choose, use. This is what I meant. This is prohibited, this page on ENG. <laughs> Stacks. But um, this would be a nice page. And what you could uh, put in the browser features, I wanted to have ES6. And this would I show you right now would work on all browsers. So and this is a difference whether you're building something. Now you see, the security team just <coughs> gave me the rights to show you this. So as you can see, this works everywhere except Opera Mini, but nothing v works on Opera Mini anyway. So I, I, whatever feature I, I tried, there was Opera Mini doesn't support anything. And Internet Explorer 11 is uh, over, almost. So if you're building for the internet, you have to be a little bit more careful. The cool story is in intranet, in all largest company, if I ask, we get Chrome or Firefox. So we can already use it. And what I do, OK, then go with Chrome. And then we have no transpilers, nothing. We use ES6, what I show you right now, without any transpilation. And this, this, this front end is as lean as the back end. One client was really stuck, uh, was really stunned that uh, I use, there is no webpack, no gulp, nothing. So, okay, there's nothing to transpile. If you like, we can generate something for you, but actually, there's no need. Okay? And I think this is the future. So, it, if it doesn't work, I show you what to do then. But this is, um, so can I use is very important. So, before you do something, you see on which browser it's working. What's also cool is it shows you, you can submit your usage and it will show you in how many percent of your clients are affected if something is not, uh, not used, a standard. Okay? So, questions? No questions? Or any questions? You're really quiet. Your colleagues in Cluj were. Somehow, far more questions they had, far more questions. Probably this is too obvious what I show you right now. But what I could do right now, let's see here, we have the main, cool. I can say main, display. Let's start with flex. And you see wonderful layout. So um, <laughs> wonderful. Uh, a wonderful flex um, direction. I think this is column. Now, column is the other one. So, this is column. 
and there is of course column reverse. This is upside down, and there is row, and row is this. So what, what, where I'm going with that, this uh, flex, you are, uh, this is the first layout. It is supported on all browsers, and this is like one dimensional. I can either model one row or a column. And the cool story is, so what, what I can give you here, of course, the sizes, everything respected. And uh, it is very similar to, um, to swing layouts or Java fixed layouts. So you don't have to play with the floats and the boxes and, and margin and padding, of course. But uh, this is more like serious UI layout. W w to save time, I would like to show you something more complex. And I'm going to your progressive app now. Grid, which is actually the future. So grid is two dimensional. This is a grid. So this is like, uh, what we did with that, you could, of course, combine that. If you like, we could do this. So I could have, you know, um, I could have um, flex in, in, uh, in rows and then one flex as a column. So I could build my own grid if you like. I would like to skip that because I would rather would like to show you the grid layout, which is more powerful. Not supported in our browsers, but there is a polyfill. Polyfill means um, we can load it right now, wait until the browsers get better, and then delete the framework. And this, is, this approach I like better than the otherwise. Start with the framework first, and then you start with the framework. So I would like to start with the standard first, the same what I said at the back end, and then add polyfills in case you have to deal with old browsers, and then delete the, the, the polyfills. Agreed? Everyone? Questions? You're a great audience. So, uh, so, grid. So then what I can do, I get to CSS and I change this to grid. And there is no flex, it's just grid. And what I can do right now, let's say enough, I'll show you first. What I can do, I can say uh, grid template rows. 1fr and 2fr, and actually I wanted to say columns first. So this is one fraction unit, and these are two fraction units. I, I can use percent, ems, rems, whatever, but fraction unit is more, is most interesting. So I skip, it means this is twice as wide as this one, okay? Then I can say grid, template rows and can say okay now now we are in rows the uh, the first one should be twi twice as high as the second one and it is and of course what we could try to do is hide 100 viewport size so this is the full screen right now and we have a grid right so this is somehow boring but if, you, if there are subgrids, so now I can have as powerful layout as a swing grid back constraints and grid back layout, which was extremely powerful. Okay, if you know already, and in mind, C Sharp or, or Visual Studio, there are very similar layouts. Agreed? This kills all grid frameworks, like Bootstrap, where you have to diff on and whatever fractions, no more frameworks. Agreed? And the cool story, this is standard. You learn it once and you know it forever. And if you have to use frameworks, Angular and the other frameworks, they will still have to understand this because what I show you, there is no framework, it's just browser. And now the cool stuff. So, but you, uh, if you have, if I misspell something, so just uh, parse with me the code because otherwise I will, I will damage the layout here. So, the cool story is now it's really cool. I can say I give a name to the areas. This grid area is the nav. Nav. I will call it like this. Footer, grid area is footer. You can call this however you like, but I would like you know, to prevent conf confusion and just uh, uh, name it as the tags. And of course, I don't have to use the tags. I could use classes or IDs, whatever you like. Grid area and uh, grid area header. And grid area article. So now, and now, <coughs> template area. 
I can say now, I can create my own grid. And I would say the first two, two slides, or two first, how to call it, two first uh, rectangles, should be a header and header. And this name has to correspond with this. Then I say article and nav, and then footer and nav, Hmm? Arias. Arias. Cool. So this is now header header, but I could say no. What I would like to to have is Stadt. In, Stadt is German. So instead of na of header here, nav, and this nav should move up exactly. So I can decide, you know, what the grid is logically, and now comes the cool part. So and now imagine, who said responsive? So I could have media queries, and depending on capabilities, I just load two different grid templates areas, and everything looks completely different, comple completely adapted to the, to the device. The key is logical structure, and easy to understand, yeah, how to call it structure, layout of the page. Agreed? The cool is now, the cool story is, now I can fine tweak with that what I showed you before, with grid columns and grid rows. So now I can say, OK, but the first one, this is way too wide. So I would like to have grid template columns and say the first one is the four fraction unit, and the last one is this one. So this is not that wide. And of course, we have one, two, three grid template rows. Is, uh, this should be the first one is, is thin. Then we have the main content, and the last one is one FR. OK. So um, and this is grid layout. And is not supported by all browsers now. But I think the next time we will meet, it will support everywhere. Because it's only evergreen browser. So it's not a matter of time it is going supported everywhere. If not, I will have to use the flex layout, which is supported everywhere, and, and, and create my own grid. But the point is, bootstrap, foundation, all the frameworks are no more necessary. And as you agree, to uh, the key to be responsive is just to replace that with depending on capabilities of the, of the device, right? Then I could rearrange whatever I like. Agreed? Cool, right? So it's just web standards. So what I tell you, the cool story for me is as a Java developer, I only learned the standard once, exactly what I did with Java E and forgot all the you know, fancy frameworks. Questions? What I would like to, yeah? Can we use, can we, uh, use anything else uh, instead of uh, fractions? Yeah, yeah. Like so pixels or something? A, a pixel are forbidden. Uh, you could, but sh you should not. Um, uh, of course, as you could say, this is uh, 10 pixels. And there are 10 pixels. But uh, there are no pixels. So pixels are absolutely, forg uh, f forget about pixels. The problem is on my machine, the pi pixel is depending on the resolution. So what you should, uh, what you can use, I would use either EM, uh, REM, which is, uh, I forgot what the name, this is like, uh, 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 REM and EM are the same. It's not, uh, the relation is different. Uh, and then percent or fraction units here are actually good because you can imagine this is one and this is four, so you can imagine what it is. Yeah, but typically you want uh, the header to be something like fixed. Uh, I mean, you want to have a header which will uh, cover um, a font of uh, 16 pixels. Yeah, but font of 16 pixels, what you will do? 16 pixels, I think, is 1 EM. Uh, I think it's 12. 12 or 14 or 16. So then we ha what we have to do is when, when 12 is 1 EM, then 16, 1.234 AM. So we have to compute that, and then we only work with EM. And the benefit is if you would increase the font size, control plus and min minus, so it, everything will rearrange as it should be. So I think the days are over where we get from the designer's pixel perfect, you know, layout. This this is not responsive. Will never work. Uh, it would, uh, yeah, it's over. But it will work. So everything works with pixels, but it's absolute not best practice because there are no more pixels. Agreed. 
So layout, I will skip the margin and padding. I wanted to show you something, but this is a trivial stuff. Instead, I would like to call the server from the client. So how to call the server? I mean, we have the server, and uh, I forgot to install the course, because I would like to show you an exception, how it looks like. Because now we have two web servers, right? This is running on port 3000, and the backend is running on 8080, in case it still runs. OK, let's see whether it still runs. Yes, so I would like to, uh, to create a list and place this Ursus and Silva to make it visible on screen, to do something like this. So first, you are a really nice audience because if someone will come on stage and say, rely on standards, I would, the first question I will ask, how long this file is supposed to be, right? It looks everything nice in this case, but I cannot write everything in one file. And then, of course, if I get the next file, the question is in which order uh, I will place the files and how many files I would like to load on the browser. And then I will have to say in HTTP 1, I can only load six files at the same time, so I will need a build process. So this would be the usual conversation, but you are nice, so you're not saying something like this. But um, what I would say is the following. What I could do is, let's say I create a class called service. And I would like to use the service class from gear view. So this is actually the big deal, right? And how to do this? So um, yeah, first, uh, service JS, uh, um, be a service in our case, uh, rename. This is early days. I have no idea whether I should use the same naming convention as in Java or not. I think I will do, because it's you know this. It's always a little bit tricky, but right now, you know, on, on Windows, there's Linux already, so there will be no problems with that. Um, so, uh, but no one cares about this. You can name it whatever you like, and this is what I don't like in JavaScript. This is too flexible. But I think it is better to name it, you know, one class per file. So, good idea. So, class beer service. And what I could do, I can say export default class service. And uh, I create a method called uh, beers. And this method returns an array first, f just for fun, with beers. And do you have different beer than silver? Something else? Chuk. What? Chuk. Chuk. C I K. <laughs> this. Yeah. Very good. And then we have Erdinger, you know, Erdinger, something uh, n not as. Neumarkt. Neumarkt? It's German. Neumarkt. Really? So international. No, you, we, we are compatible with each other. So, we have returned Chuk and Neumarkt. And now I would like to use the Chuk and Neumarkt in view. So, what I will have to do is, as Java developer, import. Uh, beer service from beer service and some, sometimes the browser will blow up when you do this not yet so and what I have to do is script app type equals module and this is the standard so the ES6 modules are already supported in Chrome and uh, going to be supported soon in all browsers. So the common JS and all the craziness they are doing right now is no more necessary. OK? So I have only one script import, and the browser will load automatically this app.js, and of course, the beer service. Now, it will still load twice. But with HTTP2, no one cares about that. With HTTP2, I can just go to the folder and sell that's four, and push proactively all the contents to the browser so no one cares when it's loaded. And HTTP2 is just a matter of time. So I think right now, you have to go to statistics. I just look up the percentage of web pages served by HTTP2. I think it's 30 40%. And next year, it's, it's going to be over, everywhere. OK. So what means export default? It means there can be only one, and I can import it this way. If there will be multiple imports, I will have to use the curly braces and, and select whatever I would like to import. And you can also import modules, which is not needed, but you could also do this. So we have this. And then I can say, OK, then this dot service or, or 
let's say here, fetch beers. And what I will do is this service equals new beer service and say here this service equals beers, I hope. Const result. By the way, there's only const or let. Uh, behaves like Java. Forget about the old var. Forbidden. So um, then console log result. And let's try that. This fetch beers. We get array back Chuk and Neumarkt. So the whole modularization works. Still no frameworks. Two files, no frameworks. No common JS, no webpack, no rollout, nothing. A huge difference to Angular, right? And you can argue with me that, OK, but in Angular I have forms and I have validation, but this is going to, to be better and better and better. It's not like this, this is the standards, OK? So this is actually, from the performance perspective and accessibility perf perspective, huge deal. Questions? By the way, yeah. We know that uh, new is a bad practice. So basically, uh, we use in J2EE the dependency injection. How can this be done in, uh, in uh, EA6? Uh, uh, dependency? ES6. In dependency injection? Yes, dependency injection. There's no dependency injection in ES6. And I have to say, I never miss dependency injection in the client. So what you could do is, of course, I could create a class app, instantiate all the stuff outside and pass it in constructor. So I could do this. But I would like the framework to do the wiring between the, yeah. uh, the beans. What what I, this is my person. You know properly Angular JS because you're asking this, right? You know Angular? Uh, a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Angular 1 was fine. On Angular 2 plus, what I really don't like is in Java E, we have dependency injection, but I don't care because if there's only one possibility, it gets injected. So we get convention of a configuration. So I skip this this time, but usually I say add inject class and it's done. So I don't have to use XML configuration of factories. In Angular, I will have to create a module, export and import the dependency, and also there's only once. I have to declare it, I think, three times. And this is crazy. So I, 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 it remembers me, you know, the old J2E days from 1960s, something like this, with X and XML is well, like the hell on earth. And now I ask myself, what is the added value? if I de declare everything three times, because then I, if I do it outside, in the, then they are only declared it once, and it's the same effect. So I have to say, I don't get the added value of dependency injection in the UI framework if it comes with so much plumbing. And as you probably know, the, uh, how it's called, the uh, preferred way of developing Angular apps is using a command line interface, which generates a lot of stuff, because using it manually is, is really hard. I mean, uh, this is uh, lots of stuff to do, right? And if, if you ask me, this is already a bad sign. If you have to use code generator, you know, to to uh, to control a framework. Agreed. But but what about if you have uh, an abstract service? I don't know if uh, ES6 uh, uh, allow uh, have uh, abstract classes. But uh, let's suppose that we have an abstract beer service. And we have Romania, Romanian beer service and German beer service, and we have a lot of new new instances uh, made like this, and we have to switch between the two service pro beer service providers so, so, or something like this. We well, don't want to to scatter all the code and to replace the new you, German uh, service. Yeah, if you have with the Romanian such a beer thing, service. that would be then would say Angular would come with added value. But I have to say, I heard a lot of arguments in the backend as well. And this is really very, very rare where one interface has two implementations. So most of the enterprise developers are building interfaces and classes for years. And there's always exact one-to-one -one relation. And then I came in and said, delete all the interfaces. They do not make any sense. If you are developing for years one-to-one, -one, what's the point of the interface? So interface is only, I allow only interfaces if there is clear that we'll get two implementations. Because with our modern tools, like WebStorm, IntelliJ, or Visual Studio Code, it's very easy to provide an interface afterwards. It's not like, you know, it would stop the projects because we've got an interface. It was different at the beginning of Java because the tooling was not there. But right now, it's very easy to introduce an interface after the fact. 
Yes, but we have to replace all the uh, instances made like this. And in JavaScript, you could use prototypes. You can replace the instances anyway. So you can do whatever like that. But uh, if you will find you know, some real a use case and you say, look, in our project, we have the problem. So there's like abstract class, and you, uh, it will be understandable to me. I will go for it. But right now, I didn't find any you know, obvious use case. Everyone talking about and, 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 and the, <laughs> the funniest thing is everyone would like to have Angular because of testing. And I rarely see good tests in Angular. It's like, yeah, in the theory, they could test, but they do not test. I mean, OK, then forget it completely. OK? But you're right. Um, dependency injection, I don't think it will be ever part of ES6. Like, dependency injection will be never part of Java 9, so or a 10 or 11. So uh, the weld from Java 8 supports dependency injection as SE, but will never uh, be part of the language. Agreed? Very good point. Other points? You're saying to use the bare one, yes? But what, what, what use? To use a bare, a, not a framework, but... The standard. Yes, the yeah. standard. Let's say in the big company, you build a lot of security part, maybe as life cycle, things like this. At the end, my opinion, you'll reach the same framework, but will be built in-house. Mm -hmm. Somehow, maybe it's a bad thing. Yeah. But, uh, the it's question only, is? It's only an opinion. Like yeah. No, you but you are right. If you are, for instance, you are a bank, and you have a, a authorization, the authentication is unique. It's not a part of the browser. Then there is no question that building a framework adds added value. But then you are building a framework against a standard, and not a framework against a moving target like Angular, Ember, or whatever framework on the market. So you know, so uh, there's a different story. What you could do, for instance, you could even you know mess up with prototypes and, and, and inject methods on every class. So every class has a method authenticate. You can absolutely do this. But I think it is easier to create a framework against web uh, web standards than creating a framework against Angular, where Angular creates ahead of time compilation and, and, and lots of magic going on. You will have to understand the magic, and you will have to keep up with the framework. Agreed. So I'm talking about technical frameworks. It's exact, exactly the same on the, on the, on the back end. If you have a security library, you have to use it. But what I see in projects, they're using Jakarta Commons logging all the commons just for fun. And then uh, frameworks uh, then use the lockbox stuff just not to have getters and setters and more and more and more. And there is no added value, no provable added value. It's just you know, lots of code generators without any reasons. What, uh, what framework uh, would I will allow, allow, or it is necessary, like if you have read Excel, you know, Apache POI, no discussion about that. So if you, have, uh, if you have security, security, compression, so you cannot build your own compressor. I mean, this is, this is, this is obvious that you need this. Excuse me, I interrupt. Saying about readability, some, some frame, yeah, this is, this is very controversial. Because many like, you know, the readability of Lombok and the other uh, young developers ask me what the getters and setters annotations do. I was like, yeah, it's just, you look at the annotation, not on the methods. I mean, it's, this is very controversial. And the cool story is, I, I really, I never saw a, a project fail because the Java code is not readable. What I saw project fail is because of exaggerated and, and cargo cult architectures, like 20 layers and everything mappers of mappers and mappers, and no one knows what they are doing. This is the problem. It's not a problem if you're building a thin Java code, you are crazy productive. And I would try you know, to prevent all the frameworks, because if you're writing Java code, it's very readable, really. And proof of concept is the longer we wait, the more JavaScript looks like Java. The cool story, what I show you right now is almost Java. This is great news to us, right? If Java would be that terrible, then the ES6 and 7 would look more like Clojure or whatever. Now. They, 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 we have inheritance, they try to mimic Java. Try and catch, that there's even more and more from Java. What we get, thread local in ES7. They're discussing thread local from Java because it's possible in JavaScript, it will be standard. We get uh, decorators, which are interceptors from Java. So if you know Java, you will be the best possible web developer based on standards. Angular zones is thread local. So try to, uh, to explain scopes or zones Angular to a, to a JavaScript programmer. And to, to tell the Java developer, Angular has thread local called zones. OK. This will be the, the, the answer, right? Because we have the concept for years. Agreed? And uh, you, I give you right. So if you have small team and everyone loves Lombok, go with Lombok. 
but you said you are a large company, then you will lose. For instance, you asked me about Kotlin. Now imagine you're a large company, and we will try you know, to establish here a corporate standard. We say, Kotlin is nice, and someone will ask, why not Scala? <laughs> so, uh, because there's no type safe and SBT, and the other guy will say, but Groovy is great, go with Groovy. And then we will stop you know, working and just discussing what is the best language. But the cool story is, if I go with Java, I will, I will answer, look, Java is number one, JavaScript is number one, no discussion. Go with that, and if this is not enough, and you show me a different language or we are faster, then we can talk. But this is like, you know, this is like the construction engineer and the drill. What do you wanted to do? Everyone with me a little bit? Or completely would be better, right? So, um, so we have two modules, two loads. Now we would like to call the server. This was the idea, right? In Angular, there is a class HTTP with dependency injection and a uh, lot of stuff, but there is a small method. What's the name? Fetch. This is in all browsers, and there's a polyfill. So, and what I can tell is, fetch me please this. Then, what, what, what we know what then is? This is asynchronous programming, and in JavaScript, they have promises. Why they have promises? Because it would be too obvious to call them futures. Okay? So promise in JavaScript is uh, very similar to future and execute or service. So um, then we can say, we get a response back, response, and then response.json. So, and what I get back is now this. And this does not work because I get strange error and uh, no access control allow origin header is present on the requested. So it means uh, because of security restriction of the browser, I'm not allowed from one server, from one domain, talk to, other, to another. This is localhost 3000 is not allowed to talk to localhost 8080. So because we have Java E, we can add dependencies, but this one is just one class. And um, this is course filter. So you have to add it. So this is, comes not out of the box. I created the filter by, by myself. It's just one class which adds all the headers. So it can do whatever you like. So course is cross-origin resource sharing. It has nothing to do with Java, nothing to do with this just part of the problem or problem of the security. And um, and we have the deal. You can stop me at a time, right? If there's two, five minutes, we have to stop in five minutes? OK. Um, this is, uh, I didn't expect the answer, right? So as I said, 50 minutes. So. Um, com air hex. So we have the. Uh, I will have to to build that. Uh, clean and build. So now Maven kicks in, and then run it, and it will rebuild everything. We are not using Docker here. So and now. Uh, so what we got bo uh, back. Uh, it says promise pending. So what I'm, what I'm getting back here is not an array of peers, rather than promise which is pending. It's like future which is not done yet. This is future.get and future is done, I think is the method. So this uh, is not done, is pending. So but what I can do in my, in my beer view, so here peers, instead of doing this, I can say, Then, this is the JSON, go here and say, and pass it here. So, Ursus and Silva, yes, this is from the backend. And now, of course, I can pass it to a method and create a list. So, how it will look like, so we have just five minutes. So, create beer list with um, beers. And what I can do, I would need here a hook. Let's say I would like to create them here in the article. So let's go here and say the following we have here. This article equals document.querySelector and call that, uh, no, just article. Just go this way. And then I can say the um, document create element. Let's go with diff. Is is uh, const beer beer in a text 
equals. So this would look strange, but um, so and this is null. You know why? Fetch peers, fetch peers, because who knows React? React JS framework. The problem is this is executed in complete different threads, is asynchronously, and what you do, the this in JavaScript is flexible. And in the listener of the fetch listener, the this means something else. This is not my this. So there was uh, previously a hack with self and so forth. So what I what I have to do, I hope this is the problem, but uh, it would be if I would start with the buttons, but I would like to show you anyway. I would have to say I bind this function, this method to this forever. And um, in some frameworks do this explicitly, like React, and in Angular, um, no, in, Angu in, in React you will have to do this by yourself, and um, Angular is auto-binding, so you don't see this, it happens behind the scenes. So this dot uh, create PL list, no, uh, what was it, fetch uh, this, fetch peers, equals, uh, this looks like this, this dot fetch peers that bind this. Oh shit. Shit was inofficial. Then you have to cut it off from the... Uh, <laughs> create peer list bind this. Still null. Create peer list peers, peers in a text. Uh, wait a second, this is not the output. You st probably we see it already, it works. It always worked, but the problem is the guy who wanted to have pixels. So I started with the pixels. Yeah, it works, right? Ursus and Silva. So it works, it was just hidden. So, but the, this bind is good to know. So um, it was probably not necessary in one of the event, but it's good to know. So Ursus and Silva, let's see. So we have the app, const, beer, inner text. No, it cannot be. And then we have to say, wait a second, is, is we, d we shouldn't see anything on the screen. Why? Because I forgot to add this element, dynamic element, which I created to my article. So right now, no, output were good news, and you are just partially, you know, fault. So it was not a full fault, but partially. So I can say this article dot append child uh, beer. Hugo Urso Silva. So now it works. So it was, you know, in the ear. So I uh, didn't expect magic from browser. It's not possible with web standards. So Hugo Urso Silva, but I created one element. Now how to create multiple elements, very similar to Java. So what I will to do is, for instance, I will have to say beers. And what I can even do is um, map like lambdas, and in this beers, no, sorry, uh, yeah, beers, I have slots, these are beers, I can say b map to what this. So for each element, create that with the inner text, and then edit, right? So this is almo almost functional programming, but uh, do I have two minutes more? Where is two minutes? Because then I could create a proper method, otherwise it would be a little bit hacky. So, um, or just go here and say beers dot uh, for each, and just say this is the beer, and I would like to output that. Ursus and silver, right? So, in the for each, I could just create. If I did, if if I put this into a method, it would work. So we'll iterate, create for each beer and diff, it could be audit, uh, audit list, grid, or whatever, or table. Now, what's the problem with my approach? Problem with my approach are tables. Because I could create table by myself, it would be as powerful as swing. So I could create, you know, I could uh, create even sorting, but at one point of time, they are not as performant. 
And not as powerful what a bank would expect. And then comes the trick. There is a standard called web components. This is like exactly like this. And what you could do, you can include ready-to-use tables. And I don't know whether you know Vaden. Vaden is in the old Java framework or pr prime faces in old Java server face framework. And um, if you search for Vaden elements, you get a lot either this or webcomponents.org. So in this webcomponents.org is, uh, is uh, lots of ready-to-use components on what the web components pack is. It defines custom elements, so a new tags which didn't exist before, like VAD and grid. And you include your grid, the grid gets an API events, and you have beautiful table with a standard. But this is understood by all browsers. So this is actually what you should start with, in my opinion. It's a web standards only. And then if the components are not powerful enough, then you can just you know, look in web webcomponents.org or go to Vaden, and you get Vaden is one of the most powerful grids. And what they are, for instance, doing, if you are scrolling, you see 10 rows on the screen. And if you are scrolling, the rows are getting reused. So it's highly performant grid. It's not like, because if I would implement by myself, I would spend probably two to three many years just to implement a proper grid. There's a lot to do. But this is, if you use React or, or, or Angular or whatever framework, you have the same problem everywhere. Now questions. We have still two minutes, I think, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. yeah. I have a question related to, to the server. So you said in the beginning that zero dependencies on client and server. And uh, let's say I tend to trust you. And uh, I'm going to switch using J2E. And uh, what about if I have an application with, I don't know, 10, uh, 10 microservices, and I want to benefit from service discovery or high availability, how can I do that with, with just one dependency? Um, this is what I wanted to show you, because if I would manage to create a load balancing between two microservices, I would, uh, I would have to find them. Yes. But you can just <laughs> give us. <laughs> OK. Or, or, or. Huh? You can talk in private. Right? Yeah, talking, but uh, show. So, um, <laughs> the, 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 uh, what everything is based is on what I would do. Uh, I, I would do it in the evening. If you have time, come, come again if you're allowed. So, th then do something else in the evening if it's allowed. Okay. Then um, you would create a network. It's actually what everything is based on. And uh, I started already with that. I, I actually wanted to show you this. I would call the first one beer one, then beer two, and the name of the container becomes the host. So, and the load balancer name would be beer. And I would use HAProxy or Nginx. This is what is used in the wild. So, now, no one would like to build it from scratch. Therefore, you would either go with Docker Swarm or OpenShift. This is the market leader. So, right now, in project is in OpenShift, exactly the same. And behind the OpenShift is Kubernetes. But this is no difference there. What Kubernetes will do. It will go to Docker and say, I need from you, you know, two. It will find them, instantiate them, and so forth. So Java is not like you know, the orchestrator. Java E is the mean to create one small microservice, which is very thin. And then you can use Kubernetes, OpenShift, Cloud, whatever you like, to orchestrate that. So there will be no difference between uh, Node.js and Java E. My point was just does um, end. By the way, the best practice is to have one operating system, one application server, and exactly one war on the application server, no shared deployments. Shared deployments do not make any sense if you see how, how low the overhead actually is. So the original idea of application servers was to save you no know, hardware because the hardware was expensive. Right now it's pointless. As what we saw is the application server consumes 40 megabytes of RAM. So uh, the, I mean, then you have wasted per microservice 40 megabytes of, web, of RAM. What I did on stage in Java 1, I compared this with Hello with Java, and Hello with Java consumed 5 megs of RAM. So the overhead per microservice using Java e is 35 megabytes of RAM. No one cares about this. So in my project, if I say, if you switch from Java e to something else and will save for 10 microservices 200 or, well, let's say, 2 gigabytes of RAM, they say, OK, I don't care about this. My iPhone is more powerful than your you know, savings. And by the way, one open Chrome is consumes more memory, one Chrome tab, than an application server. The old WebSphere excluded. 
liberty is completely different. I mean, the old website is that. I mean, the, the, the new one for years is liberty. Okay, now we have to stop, I think, or she, we can go away, right? So she's happy, so. <laughs> no, we have to stop, so. Uh, any questions? So I can ask the questions the, 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 the whole night without any topics. Questions? Uh, the question is about security. So, I mean, you 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 are thinking that Docker is not as secure, right, as something. So, so they spend a lot of time of security. I I'm, I don't know whether there are many exploits. What I know, there's also uh, exploits in uh, in virtualization technology in all of them. So KVM and VMware everywhere are exploits. So, um, but from the theoretical perspective, virtualization has to be more secure than Docker, because Docker is process isolation with containers, it's based on C group namespaces, something else. And virtualization is you are you are you are you are virtualizing the full o the, the operating system. So it has to be more secure. Having said that, all the clouds and everything is based on Docker. It's like it's over. I mean Docker is like yeah, yeah uh, is production yeah we use Docker in production. It, you say is production ready? What it what it does not mean that you can just push your application to to, to containers and, and and you are ready to go. There are small issues like computation of the max memory. You know this if you say max RAM 512 in Java, it is not the full RAM. There's this RSS how it's called the resource uh, Linux classes has to be added in. So there are lot lot small things which you have to be aware of this. But um, we use token production, so it is absolutely ready and. Um, Amazon EC ECS, uh, Oracle Cloud, uh, Google, uh, Google uh, Docker containers, they're using Docker for years, and Docker is actually old technology. Very good, thank you. Other questions? No, then what do we have now? For open style discussion, right? So now you can ask me directly without the stage, right? So I understood. So okay then, uh, thank you, and uh, see you in two seconds. So.